Well, good morning, church. If you have your copy of the Word of God with you this morning, let me invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, we're going to be in verses 21 through 35, finishing up the chapter. Matthew chapter 18, and while you're turning there, let's briefly rehearse what we've seen in chapter 18. In the first passage of Matthew 18, we saw how the requisite, what's required for entrance into the kingdom is being converted and becoming like a child. Jesus taught that it's not the pursuit of status in the kingdom, which is what the disciples were seeking to gain. You may remember that as we look through that. Um, but it's an attitude of the heart, an attitude of humility that ultimately matters in the kingdom of heaven. And having this attitude of humility will, will keep us from being a, a stumbling block, which was the next passage that we looked at. Jesus uh, taught a very hard truth there that if someone were to cause a child of God to stumble, it would be better for that person to have a millstone hung around his neck, thrown into the sea to be drowned. Uh, stumbling blocks are serious business. And God loves his children dearly, and he doesn't want them to stumble. But if they should stumble, God will see to it that he will come after them. Um, Jesus told the parable of the lost sheep to illustrate this, like a, a sheep that wanders off the range, and a good shepherd goes and gets it, God goes after his wayward sheep to bring them back into the fold, right? God loves his wayward sheep. He'll go get them, bring them back into the sheepfold. And he, he uses, in fact, the church to do that, which is what we saw with the passage on church discipline from last week. You may remember that. And it's that context that we continue in, especially the previous passage on, ch on church discipline, which contains the idea of forgiveness for the one who repents. Forgiveness for the one who repents. In other words, if a, a brother goes to another brother about their sin and they repent, they should be forgiven. It's that simple. And though the text that we looked at last week doesn't mention forgiveness per se, it's clearly implied and brought into clear focus in the passage that we're in this morning, okay? So let's get into it, verses 21 through 35 of Matthew 18, and we start here in verse 21. The text says, Then Peter came up and said to him, speaking to Jesus, Lord, how often will, I, uh, will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Well, when I was preparing for this message this week, I, I thought to myself, well, oh boy, here's another one of those instances where Peter's going to be just like Peter, right? I mean, uh, the old kind of ready um, fire and then aim Peter. Is this the kind of Peter that we're, we're seeing here? And certainly Peter um, is about to have his worst moment, you know, uh, in his life where the Lord, you know, said to him, hey, I'm, I'm going to the cross. And he said, you know, far be it from me, Lord, that, you know, that's, that should happen to you. And of course, um, we, we know that uh, later on, Peter's going to do what? He's going to deny the Lord three times and, and go out and weep bitterly because of it. This is going to be Peter's worst moment of his life. But the, the question is, I mean, is this how we should understand Peter here? Is Peter just being Peter <laughs> uh, in this passage um, in this instance, I don't think Peter and his question carries the same level of infraction. In fact, Peter recognizes Jesus as Lord. Did you see that? He, he knows also that if his brother sins against him, he should do what? He should forgive him. And, and here's another detail that we don't get unless we have a little background. Uh, it was stated by the rabbis and was likely a point of conversation among Jews in Peter's day that, quote, if a brother sins against you once, forgive him. A second time, forgive him. A third time, forgive him. But a fourth, do not forgive him. It was, it was four strikes and you're out. This was before baseball. Okay? 
Uh, No more forgiveness once you commit that final fourth sin against a brother. That was the tradition um, that likely is behind what it is that that Peter is saying. So let's, let's recognize that Peter is doing better than that tradition, right? He comes to Jesus and says, should I forgive him as many as seven times? That's, that's, again, greater than that tradition. I, I'm seeing a little room for some mercy toward Peter in this one. How about you? But Jesus still has something to teach this disciple, Peter, uh, three years into his training, by the way. Look at Jesus' response. Jesus said to him, I do not say seven times, but 77 times. Peter, seven times is not enough. If your brother sins against you 77 times, you should forgive him 77 times. A couple things here. One is that we aren't really sure how to translate the Greek word behind 77. Uh, Does it mean 70 times seven? Uh, Your translation, maybe the one that you have in front of you, may say 70 times seven. Um, and just you do the math on that, that's 490. You're welcome. I did graduate, you know, I don't know what grade school math that is, but 490 times you should forgive your brother according to that particular translation. Or does the Greek mean, as other translations say, 77? Well, the way it seems to go in this direction, uh, because the same word is used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, with respect to Lamech's revenge, we read there in Genesis 4.24, if Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is 77-fold. That 77-fold, that's the same word uh, that's in the Greek there in Matthew 18, which translates a Hebrew expression that clearly means 77. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, There are some other thorns in this issue that I don't want to get too hung up on this morning. At the end of the day, whether it refers to 77 or 490, the point is the same. We are to forgive our brother without limits. We are to forgive our brother or sister without limits. Now, what this doesn't mean is that there are no consequences for sins when someone sins against you. What do I mean? Well, you know the whole phrase, forgive and forget, right? We all know that phrase and there's some truth to it. But sometimes that phrase gets misused as if it indicates we as Christians should be kind of like doormats that others can step all over. For example, says the commentator Dan Doriani, if someone tells a pernicious lie about me, I must forgive the liar. But I can also insist that he helps set the record straight. After someone sins against us, we're not bound to pretend that nothing ever happened. If a neighbor borrows money and fails to repay it, then comes to borrow more, we must forgive the offense. But we have no obligation to extend a second loan. So you see, forgiving doesn't mean we allow ourselves to be taken advantage of, right? Jesus said that we're to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. But the point shouldn't be lost on us as we navigate Jesus' teaching in the wake of the rest of Scripture. We are to forgive without limits. That means that we aren't supposed to carry around a little clicker ticking off every time someone sins against us. Uh, there's, there's 77, 78, and we're done here, all right? Uh, you know, we're, we're not supposed to have like, you know, an app in our phone, you know, the notes app, and then have a little folder that says, you know, every time so-and-so sins against me, and you got a little catalog there of every sin. We're not supposed to do that, right? The, the scripture says things like this, love does not keep a record of wrongs. You are to Colossians three twelve. forgive one another. If anyone has a grievance against another, we as Christians, are to be people of forgiveness. That's what Jesus wanted Peter to hear very clearly. And it's no accident that this comes right on the heels of the passage on church discipline. Remember how we looked at church discipline last week? The attitude to sin that Jesus was addressing was one that was stiff-necked, right? I'm not going to repent. Take your confrontation somewhere else. 
That's the attitude that Jesus is addressing in Matthew 18. That's a totally different attitude than the one that is presented by Peter's question. The issue in Peter's question is someone who sins but has, this is the key, an attitude of repentance. An attitude of repentance. They aren't stiff-necked. In, in the parallel account in Luke, it's clear that this is how we should understand this issue. Jesus says there, if your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must what? Forgive him. So if this passage helps us understand what's going on in Matthew 18, and I think it does, we know that the issue Peter is talking about is when someone sins with multiple offenses against him. If they turn and confess their sins, how many times must we forgive them? Well, without limits. Without limits. Jesus is saying every single time they turn in repentance, you must forgive them. And to that effect, church discipline is never necessary, is it? It never has to go to the second stage or the third stage or the fourth stage. Your brother sins, they repent, forgiven, no need to bring that sin up for a second stage or another stage of discipline. Do you see that? It, it gets left there um, at the threshing floor and it's, it's gone. Jesus is saying we're to forgive our brother or sister without limits. But why is that? What's really behind our forgiveness motivating us to forgive others? What, what, what really drives us to forgive another brother or sister in Christ? Those are actually questions that Jesus, by the parable that he's about to tell, answers for us as we work our way through the parable. Let's, let's take a look at it, beginning in verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. So here is the parable and the conflict in the parable. We have a king who has servants and those servants are being called to give an account of what they owe him. One such servant owes the king 10,000 talents. In that day, a talent possessed the highest value of currency. It was, you know, above every other um, piece of currency that they used in, in that day. Talent was the absolute highest. And by yearly wages, it was worth about 20 years of wages for a laborer. And in the parable, the servant owes how many talents? 10,000. And so you just do the math. That's 200,000 years of wages he owes. 200,000 years of wages. That's a lot of wages. Now, if you look at a handful of different commentators, they'll all differ on how to quantify this in American dollars. One commentator believes that this would be equivalent to zillions of dollars. <sighs> Now, his commentary was written in the 1980s. You have to take into consideration inflation since then. And with that, we may be at a number that's 15 times the current national debt of $35 trillion. Or to put it another way, and I think this is the point of Jesus' parable, the servant has an incalculable debt. An incalculable debt. His debt is so big, he can't repay it on his own. Did you notice that the master ordered him to be sold? And even his wife and his children, point being, he can't repay this on his own. He's got to have his assets liquidated. His wife and children now have to get involved in forced labor to pay off his debt. He can't pay this debt on his own. Are you seeing that? But don't miss what we should draw from this spiritually. The king represents God, right? And the servants are sinners who owe a spiritual debt to God because of their sins. And their debt is so great that they can't pay it. Their debt's so great. Sinners' debt is so great that they cannot pay it to God. And the only hope that they have, the only hope that they have is to fling themselves into the arms of God's mercy. That's all the hope that they have. We have to appeal to God's mercy. And that fact is demonstrated in the parable notice. Notice. 
So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. Did you notice that the servant got more than what he bargained for? He came to the king hoping for an extension or to receive an extension on his bill. He said to to this master, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. He didn't even ask to be forgiven of his loan, but the king went above and beyond by not only releasing him, mercy, but also forgiving him of his incalculable debt, abundant mercy. Mercy and abundant mercy. Mercy. Do you think maybe, just maybe, Jesus is saying something about God here? I've been teaching on the topic of salvation lately. Uh, hashtag Wednesday night class on salvation, just in case you're interested in joining. And what I keep coming back to over and over again is that God's mercy toward us in Christ is abundantly rich. I mean, it's like the waves of the sea. Just when you thought, that's the last wave, well, here comes another one and another one and another one. God is so abundantly rich toward us in Christ. And you study these themes of the scripture, God's election of us from eternity past, God's calling of us in in history, the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit that results in faith and repentance, that then uh, issues in a life of sanctification that's fueled by the Holy Spirit of God, that then ends in glorification where God will fully and finally conform us into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, where we will spend eternity with him in the new heavens and the new earth. And you think all of this is because God is merciful to us and we earned nothing of it. You, you, you got to think, wow, God's mercy is, is unbelievable. It's so vast. And all of that grace is given to us in Christ. And what the par- parable allows us to meditate on at this point is the abundance of God's mercy in particular to forgive us our debt. Like we already said, we have a debt to God, right, that we cannot pay but someone must pay for it if we're going to be released from it. And the one who pays it can't be a sinful man because God won't take the payment of a sinful man, will he? He demands absolute perfection. So the only option is that God has to become a man and has to pay for it as a man for us. He has to humble himself and become like one of us and in his humanity he has to pay the debt. And by the way, this is the point that Matthew wants to make in his gospel. He wants to make the point that Jesus is God in the flesh who has come to pay the debt of his people. The angel of the Lord who appeared to Joseph in a dream said as much. You remember this at the beginning of Matthew. We read there in Matthew 1, 21 through 23, She, Mary, will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus is God with us, and and what will he do? He will save his people from their sins. And in chapter 16, Matthew begins to give hints about how that saving is going to come about. He says in verse 21, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. The same prediction is given again in chapter 17, verses 9 through 12, and again in verses 22 through 23, and again in chapter 20, verses 19 or rather 18 18 through 19, Jesus is unmistakable to his disciples that he is on a mission. He is going to Jerusalem and there be crucified and three days later rise from the dead. But the meaning of of all of that, what's the meaning of all of that? How, How should we understand that death and that resurrection of this one who is called the Son of God, well, Matthew doesn't leave us without a clear testimony of it. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. A ransom. This word ransom is the word lutron. 
in the Greek. It's the same word that was used whenever someone would issue a price to buy someone out of slavery. It was, it was the price, the ransom price that was given so that a slave could be set free. And, and it's no accident. I think that that's the same word that's used to describe what Christ accomplished for his people. That in fact, that when he went to the cross, his death was the debt or the payment of the debt that we owed. So that what he accomplished on the cross was sufficient to buy us out of the slave market of sin, to set us free and to give us forgiveness from God. Colossians 3.13 says that God has forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of what? Debt that stood against us with its legal demands. They see set aside, nailing it to the cross. God is so abundantly rich in mercy, isn't he, church? So how could we ever withhold mercy from our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? That's the question that that leads us into the rest of the parable. Look here, beginning at verse 28. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. That last verse right there is a pretty powerful, potent verse, isn't it? Pretty particular. And before we get to that, though, I I want us to, to notice some things about the parable Did you notice that the servant owed to the servant that was forgiven his debt? How many denarii? A hundred denarii. And in that day, a denarii was a, or denarius was a normal day's wage for a laborer. A servant would go do their work and would receive at the end of the day one denarius. So this servant owed his servant 100 days worth of, of wages, we should see. Compare that to the amount that the first servant owed. He owed 200,000 years worth of wages. Do you see what Jesus is doing with the story then? Here is the servant who owed something like 36,000 times the amount of debt as the servant he is demanding payment from. And though he was forgiven a tremendous debt, he can't forgive this minuscule sized debt of his debtor. The spiritual point, I think, is very clear. How how could someone who claims to be forgiven an eternal debt by God not forgive a temporal sin of his brother or sister? Douglas O'Donnell says it like this. Our debt to God is like the distance from the earth to the sun. But our debt to one another, you sin against me or I sin against you, is like the distance between Chicago and Indianapolis or Tulsa to Lawton. As viewed from the sun... There's real distance, but it's not comparable. And if God can bridge the first, then we should bridge the second. If God can bridge the first, we should bridge the second. It's clearly what Jesus is saying. We who are forgiven by God for all our sins ought also to forgive the sins of our brothers and sisters in Christ. This idea is repeated in other places in the New Testament. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted." forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Colossians 3.13, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. The motivation for our forgiveness of others is that we have been forgiven by God through the atoning blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We forgive because He forgave. 
the forgiven forgive. It's that simple. And so the degree to which we walk in the forgiveness of God is the degree to which we forgive others, right? It places a high premium then on walking in God's forgiveness, of, of reminding ourselves often of the forgiveness that we have received in Christ. And this is why Sunday mornings are, are so beautiful because we gather together as the body of Christ and we sing songs that remind us about our forgiveness and the death of Christ and what it is that his death accomplished. We sang this morning those words, his mercy is more, which, which begin with what love could remember, no wrongs we have done, omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into the sea without bottom or shore, our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. His mercy is more. And we come together, we partake of the 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 communion, the Lord's Supper. And in the Lord's Supper, we're reminded, aren't we, that his body and his blood were given for us for the purpose of issuing us into a new covenant so that our sins could be forgiven, right? We gather together as the body of Christ is one of the the means and the ways by which God has ordained that we should remind ourselves about how we've been forgiven. And there are so many other ways that we can remind ourselves of the forgiveness that we've received through Christ. But all of these things are reminders to us for the purpose, not that we just praise God, but also as we turn out toward our brothers and sisters, that the same forgiveness we've received from God should also extend to them. They should also be forgiven because we have been forgiven much. Amen. Yet Jesus tells the parable because he knows that in our flesh, we don't like to forgive. The flesh wants to be like the character in the parable who resorts not to forgiving, but to choking the offended or the offender. And maybe it's not a, like a physical choking that Jesus has in mind by application, but at the very least, a kind of emotional choking. Uh, we can think about this in marriage, right? Um, you know, maybe a spouse, um, a, a spouse like does something and then asks for forgiveness, but the other spouse for the rest of the day just, you know, man, silent treatment, right? Just, just kind of an emotional choking that just chokes out the life of the relationship. I mean, that can happen. Or, or a, a wife that misplaces her phone and, and, you know, comes to the husband for the zillionth time and says, Where's, can you help me find my phone? You know, a husband can be like, I- I'm done. No more looking for the phone. You have asked me way too many times. Forgiveness has run up. I don't speak from experience or anything here. But we can do these kind of things, right? In a marriage relationship or relationship with others, we kind of emotionally choke one another out so that we just kind of suck the life right out of the relationship. And all we got to do is, brothers and sisters, all we have to do is forgive. All we have to do is forgive, but instead it's so easy in our flesh to just create this root of bitterness in our hearts. And that root of bitterness has a really serious like result. I want to share with you this verse. You're probably familiar with it, but remember this, see to it that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and by it many become defiled. You know, in other words, be diligent to not let your hearts become bitter toward your brothers and sisters in Christ. If this kind of thing takes root, and this is why we need to take it serious, because a, a verse like this tells us that these little, these little things of bitterness, we might call them little, but they create a root in your heart. And, and that root causes disruption, and in this case, what? Defilement. It can affect the entire body of Christ when there's, when, when there's bitterness that's left unchecked. This is why we have to, as this verse says, see to it that there's no root of bitterness in your heart. Cut that off. Uproot that. It's going to affect the entire body of Christ. You know that little adage, right? Bitterness is like drinking poison and hoping the other person will die. You heard that one before? Rod, you heard that one before? No, he hadn't heard that one before. Okay. Anna, you've probably heard it before. Bitterness is not some private little problem that I can just keep to myself. It's poison that destroys communities of people. 
Of course, we live in a society, don't we, that says things like, um, you know, why is your business to get into my business? If I'm doing something wrong, why do you even care? It doesn't hurt you, just leave me alone, right? That's, that's our society, right? Well, what I do in private is none of your business, and we would expect that from the world, wouldn't we? Um, sinful people of the world act and think like s- sinful people of the world, right? But we can't let that infiltrate the church because we know that a member's private sin or whatever that sin is has absolutely the potential to defile the church. So we can't have this attitude of, well, this is my business, you just stay out of it. No, a a root of bitterness can defile the church. It leads to all kind of problems and relationships, and it destroys unity and spreads light, gain, green. None of us should tolerate it. And, And that's why Jesus wants us to take an honest look in the mirror and say, where am I like the choker in the parable? Where am I like this? And where do I need to align myself more with the king in the parable, this gracious king, this merciful king? It's a gracious invitation of Jesus to step into that introspection, to quote Dan Doriani again. He says, this is the wisdom and mercy of Jesus. He shows us our worst tendency, not through an accusation, but through a story that lets us rebuke and correct ourselves. Step into the light is what Jesus is saying, brothers and sisters. Where does this change need to happen in your life and in mine? Now, alongside that gracious invitation of Jesus in this parable, there is a warning. Did you notice that warning as we read it earlier? Let me bring us back to verses 34 through 35. Jesus says there, And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers, until he should pay all his debts. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Uh, We shouldn't just kind of skedaddle past this one, guys. It really is, I think, the exclamation point on this parable. And if we're honest, it makes us a little nervous, doesn't it? I mean, I thought once we are saved, we're always saved. How could Jesus be saying to his disciples that if they don't forgive other Christians, God won't forgive them with the implication that they will pay that debt in hell forever? I had these kind of questions this week, and I wrestled with this question and these questions this week. And you need to know I've come out stronger in my convictions on what I believe the scripture teaches on this, and I'm thankful for that. But in my wrestling, I did read some commentaries, and one of the commentaries, one I greatly respect in so many ways, concluded that what Jesus was talking about when he spoke about God's forgiveness here is that forgiveness we receive that restores us to fellowship with God. In other words, he taught that this is not about ultimate forgiveness from the penalty of sin, which is eternity in hell. This is about God forgiving us so that his children, or as his children, we can enjoy again our fellowship with him that we lost through sinning against him. And let me just affirm, there is that kind of forgiveness in Scripture, right? As a Christian, we have the promise from God's word that what? 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, what? He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a beautiful verse. It's in the book. We need to believe it and we need to live it. If we have sinned against our father, we we have the promise that if we confess our sin to him, then he'll restore us to fellowship with himself. That's, That's a beautiful promise of the scripture. But is that what Jesus is referring to in this passage? Well, you probably already feel a little bit like I don't think that's what he's talking about. And I take my cue from verse 34. Actually, I need to go back to verse 34. I'm sorry. God is likened here to the master and king who punishes the servant for his debt. Spiritually speaking, that debt, as we've already concluded, is the debt of sin, the punishment of which is eternal punishment. So when Jesus speaks about his heavenly father not forgiving someone, he's talking about not forgiving them of the debt which leads to an eternity in hell. That's how I'm convinced that we should understand what Jesus is talking about here. Now that still leaves the question, how do we understand this warning then? Let me walk through that with you. Jesus is addressing the disciples at large. The you in verse 35, that's plural. 
He's addressing all the disciples. And when Jesus or the authors of the New Testament address the Christian community at large, they issue warnings. And those warnings are real. And those warnings are serious. And in this particular warning, Jesus is basically saying that if you claim to have been forgiven by God, yet your heart is a heart of unforgiveness perpetually, you will not be forgiven by God. We could say it another way. You have not been forgiven by God. And let me explain that some more. What what does God do when he regenerates us? You know, that, that popular phrase, which comes from the Bible, being born again. What does that mean when we say being born again, as an expression that we all know? Well, it means that we get a new heart, right? God gives us a new heart. He, he takes out a heart of stone that's resistant to him, and he replaces that with a heart of flesh, a heart that wants to obey him and love him. Notice this from Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27. This verse, or these verses saying, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a, a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. When we are born again, we get a new heart and a new spirit and the Holy Spirit who helps us walk in the ways of Christ. And, and one of the areas that he helps us in, and you may have guessed it already, is that he helps us to forgive one another. And, and so if, if we practice forgiveness of one another, though we may not be perfect in it. How many of you, you ready? My, my forgiveness is perfect. Anybody? Ross, you ready? No, no, none of us are ready to do that. Our forgiveness is not perfect. But the fact that we've been made new by God means that being made new, we have a new heart with a new will that desires to do new things. And one of those things that we do, though imperfectly, is we forgive one another. We practice forgiveness. Why? Because we've been, what, forgiven by God. But if we don't practice forgiveness, it shows that we're not forgiven by God. If we have a heart of unforgiveness, we have not received God's forgiveness. This isn't salvation by forgiveness of others. The scripture testifies that we love because he first loved us. We forgive others because he what? First forgave us. The forgiven, they forgive. We can't get the heart, the cart before the horse. I almost said the heart. I actually, I think I did. That's kind of fitting. The heart before the horse. I don't know. We'll have to figure that one out. Now, we we can't get the cart before the horse on this one. We get justified in a new heart, and then that new heart issues a new activity. Amen? And one of the things that it issues in is forgiveness of others, because we indeed have been forgiven much. It's the warning of Jesus here. If you have any more questions about that, I'm available for a phone call or an email or anything else. I'd love to talk to you about that. But this, this, this warning this morning, I think, is, is a, a good opportunity for us to, if we're here this morning and we have an issue in our hearts where we're harboring bitterness and unforgiveness toward another brother or sister, we, we need to take seriously the words of Jesus, right? If there's a root of bitterness in our heart, then we, we, we need to get rid of it. We need to cut it off. We need to hack it to pieces, right? It doesn't belong in the heart or my heart as children of God. Confess it to God, come clean and forgive your brother or sister from the heart. Again, because you've been forgiven much, right? We have been forgiven in an incalculable debt by God. How can we withhold forgiveness from our brother or sister? Father, thank you for the forgiveness that we have in Christ. It is not by merit. It is not because you looked down the corridors of time and saw us forgiving others and you said, oh, I'm going to save him on the basis of that. No, you saved us by your own mercy and according to your own grace. And having been saved and having learned as we've studied the scripture just how great you've been to us and how merciful you've been to to us, Lord, it is obviously very natural for us to turn around and to forgive others. So, Father, refresh us this morning in what you have accomplished for us and how you have forgiven us and shown us mercy so that uh, 
we can be merciful and forgive one another. Lord, we love you. And as we forgive one another this week, would you encourage our hearts? And would you allow that forgiveness to mend relationships? Would you allow that forgiveness to produce within our relationships the desired result that you have for us? And that is purity in our walk with you. To become more like Christ in our characters. And Father, should you do that, and we pray that you will, we'll give you all the glory and all the praise, and we know that it will be toward our good. We pray this in the mighty and precious, merciful name of Christ. And everybody said, Amen. Church, you are loved, forgiven, and dismissed.